Hi, my name is Alex Vaccaro. I'm a professor of spine surgery at Thomas Jefferson University and the president of the Rothman Institute. You're listening to Interview with a Surgeon with a Surgeon Agent. On this episode of Interview with the Surgeon, we welcome Dr. Alex Vaccaro, president of Rothman Orthopedics since 2014 and the Richard H. Rothman Professor and Chairman in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery and Professor of Neurosurgery at Thomas Jefferson University. He was the recipient of the Leon Witzel Award given for excellence in leadership in clinical research for spine care for the North American Spine Society and is the past president of Cervical Spine Research Society, American Spinal Injury Association, and the Association for Collaborative Spine Research. He's over 820 peer-reviewed and two 200 non-peer-reviewed publications. He's the editor-in-chief of Clinical Spine Surgery. He's published over 372 book chapters. He's the editor of over 63 textbooks and co-editor of OKU Spine 1, editor of OKU 8, director of the Regional Spinal Cord Injury Center, Delaware Valley, and co-director of Spine and Surgery, Spine Fellowship Program at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital. He instructs current fellows and residents in the diagnosis and treatment of various spinal problems and disorders. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining Interview with the Surgeon. Today, we welcome Dr. Alex Vaccaro, president of Rothman Institute. Doc, how are we doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks, Matt. I, today, I said, this is what I'm doing. They go, oh, is that the guy that does disability insurance and does a podcast? I go, I, we used him. So they, I met with him today. They know you. So you're famous. <laughs> Doc, I'm just trying to get on your level. That's all we're doing here. <laughs> just jump right into it. What were your goals and aspirations during your residency, and how did those change during your fellowship? When I was a resident, I went to a highly competitive program, and I always had a desire to be an academic professor. That's what I wanted to do. So back, and this is talking 1988 to 1992. So I trained at a place called uh, Thomas Jefferson University, and my chairman was Dick Rothman. He was one of the fam famous orthopedic surgeons, and he had written several seminal textbooks. So I was focused on my goal of being a professor. So what do you got to do when you want to be a professor? You got to do research. You got to publish and you have to walk on the national podium and present papers. So all I was doing was collecting data, analyzing data, doing statistics and data and looking for opportunities to write that up and to give presentations, which is a scary thing when you're a young surgeon standing in front of, you know, a thousand, two thousand, three thousand people presenting scientific data that, you know, people in the audience know better than you do. So that was what I was focused on. Now, remember, over time, the world has changed today. Not many people are going into academic medicine, and it's small and small and smaller. People don't want to sacrifice the years that it takes, so people are going into private practice now. But back then, I knew what I wanted to do. I knew what I needed to do. I needed to write, publish, write, publish, present, and that was my ticket if I wanted to be a professor. And then, you know, circumstances had it. I got hired by Dick Rothman at Thomas Jefferson University. And I never left. So in 1988, I'm sitting in the same. In fact, I'm in an apartment right now because I, I moved out of a, my house just temporarily for six weeks, my wife and I and kids. And I'm sitting in the place that I rented in 1988. And here's the funny thing. This is right across the street from Thomas Jefferson University. This place cost me $886 for this two-bedroom apartment in 1986. 5000 bucks today. See how things have changed? That's, That's the truth. Crazy. Yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm right across the street from the hospital, uh, which is great because I've always taken another little tip I give to surgeons is I don't like to spend time in a car. And you're in LA, I'm in Philadelphia. People commute hour, hour and a half. That's three hours each way, three hours a day. I usually live right across the street from the hospital that I work at. Now that sounds crazy. I trained at Cedar sinai I lived on Burton Way right across the street. So... I walk out of the hospital. Now, cities are nice. I, I, I live in a, a nice apartment right now. Um, so, some hospitals are not in nice neighborhoods and you can't get a, an apartment, but it's great. I literally leave the operating room at 3.15 and I'm talking to you at you know, 3.30 from my house. So one little tip, make your life convenient when you have an opportunity to make it convenient. I like that. Can you kind of take us through, I understand you got hired by Roth and right out of school, but can I take you through that job search process was there anything that, that you noticed that maybe you would have done differently now looking back or anything that you went through that was a kind of unique experience for you? Yeah, yeah. So I would have done it completely different. So I'm a, you know, we have to do a four-year residency program and a year fellowship. So my second year residency, I get a tap on the shoulder from my boss and he says, listen, I want you to come back and work here. So I turn around to my idol and I say, Yes, sir. And that was my end of my job search. I was like, and that now, but, but I'm locked in, which was a mistake. I'm locked in now because I committed early. 
I didn't go out. I didn't see what was out there. I didn't explore. I committed early. And when I did my fellowship with Steve Carfin at University of California, San Diego, he offered me a job also. And I said, you know, I can't take it. I took a job already. And I, I missed all the opportunities. So another thing I would tell people is that don't commit early. Figure out what you want. Now, what do people want? Well, you may have a partner. You have to consider what the partner wants. You have to be in a geographic location that is something that you would enjoy or like. Most people um, decide to go to a place where their families live, either their partner's family or their family. That's number one. Most people don't say, listen, this, you know, it's beautiful out in California. I think I'm going to try there. They always look for places they're familiar with. The second thing you have to work for, look for is you have to find out what's compatible with your personality. People go into four areas now when they graduate. They either work at a hospital system, and I'm not talking about an academic system, I'm talking about like a Kaiser. Two, they go to an academic setting, less and less nowadays. Three, they go to a multi-specialty group, or four, they go to a single specialty group, either private practice or a large group. I'm at the Rothman Institute, so we're a private practice group, but we have 220 people. So we're a big, big orthopedic group. <laughs> Most people uh, can't afford to go into private practice. I mean, very rarely, is there a two, three, four, five man group that exists? And if it does exist, they really can't afford to cover the expenses that it takes to bring in another surgeon. Electronic medical records, you know, all the uh, quality insurance, uh, things that we have to go through nowadays. So most people are, are looking for larger systems. So if you look at the numbers, about 70% of people now go into a healthcare system slash academics environment, which I think is a shame. I would advocate that every orthopedic surgeon look for an opportunity to be autonomous, join a large orthopedic private practice. Multi-specialty group is okay because you have, a, you have a committed population of patients that will come to you, but the deal may not be good for you because you may be the revenue generator in your group as an orthopedic specialist. I mean, you work a lot with the plastic surgeons, so you can imagine a surgeon in that specialty is probably bringing a lot of revenue that is used to offset lost leaders in the field multi-specialty group, you'll have certain specialties that really don't have good reimbursement contracts. So you may be working as the engine for that particular group. So my recommendation for most people is you want to be autonomous. You want to develop the direction that your group wants to go in. We're moving to outpatient surgery now. You want to be a leader in that. You want to set up ambulatory surgical centers, possibly expand when the law allows physician-owned hospitals. If you work for a healthcare system, your only input is your advice, your opinion, and that may not take you far. So that's what I would do now. So if I had to do it again, I'd probably say, you know something? I want to join you, but can I get back to you? And then look around a little bit. I may, have, I may lose the opportunity. You may say, listen, I gave you an opportunity and I passed. But I'd probably look around first before I made the early commitment. Now, dealing with residents and fellows, both at Thomas Jefferson and at Rothman, what are type of the questions that you get from them asking, you know, as far as they're going into the professional job market, what type of things do you see that they're looking for or asking about? So I have 16 chief residents who graduate every year. And then outside of that, I have um, four spine fellows. I'm a spine surgeon. So, and they always ask me across the board, uh, I'll, I'll go through the top down question. They usually say, um, when they first join me, they say, listen, I want to be a professor like you. So can you please hire me as a fellow? And I know that's a lie. That's because I'm a, I'm a professor and I want to train academic surgeons. So I always laugh. I go, the chances of you going to academic medicine is about 2%, but I like the line. Now, when they're graduating, all of a sudden, there's no academic jobs available. Now they'll look into private practice, which is what they had always wanted to do. And then they, well, the next thing they say to me is they, they're sort of afraid to approach me because I'm a professor and let me know they're going to go for private practice. But after a while, they say, listen, I'm looking at these five jobs. Can you help me look at the job? and they hand me the contract. I always say, the first thing is, when you get a contract, give it to a guy like me who writes contracts. I write the contracts to hire everybody with my staff. So I know everything about a contract. I know the laws about non-competes. I know salary. I know benefits. I know um, the opportunity to get an ex uh, a physician extender, such as an MA, NP, or PA. I know all the rules. I know what it costs. I know exactly what the benefits are. So I say, let me take a look at that. And I look closely at opportunities to become a partner, how many years to become a partner, ownership rights in ancillary services, uh, and how they determine salary, how um, 
when do you get a medical assistance, an MP, how many years in practice do you have to be and so forth. So I look at all those things for them and I'm like, okay, this is a reasonable contract. The first thing that strikes me about a contract that I look at is I look at the non-compete. If you're in the city, the non-compete distance has to be smaller. If you're in a suburb, it's larger. You also have to realize that many states don't honor non-competes anymore. I had a gentleman leave me who was a spine surgeon here in Philadelphia and he was going like next door. So we exercised our right to challenge his non-compete. And after two years and a lot of money, the New Jersey judge said, yeah, I'm not going to honor it. Ripped it up. Shocking. So there's, I mean, state of California will not honor a non-compete in medicine. I have people out there all the time that leave their groups and they get sued. Won't honor non-compete. It doesn't mean ignore the non-compete, but keep that in mind. If there's a, a burdensome non-compete, that's a reflection of the attitude of those who own the practice you join. Now, starting salaries is the next thing I look at. I know what the competitive salary is for a spine surgeon. I'm a spine surgeon. So if someone comes in really low, and let me tell you the states that come, what state do you think comes in the lowest for salaries for spine surgeons? Let me think. Oh, California, where you're sitting right now. They come in the lowest for spine, which is amazing because people want to be there. It's a very difficult state. So I said, okay, you know, they're coming in low, beautiful state. Everyone wants to be in California. So let's take a look. Um, I need to have an understanding of how much everyone else in the group makes. How many years to partnership? Will you have ownership in the real estate? That's a little game that a lot of people in, in businesses have. They allow you to come in as a partner, but you don't own the real estate. Oh, who owns the real estate? The older physicians own the real estate, which means you're paying the older physicians and still go to work every day because you're paying for the rent for the building. You're paying for the upkeep. You're paying for so, and you're not profiting from that at all. So you say, listen, in my opinion, at the Rothman Institute, once you become a partner, you have equal ownership in everything, which means the owners get diluted, but we get diluted for a purpose to get bigger, larger, more stable. So that's the second thing I look at. I say, let me, let me look at that. And then the last thing is, you know, get an understanding, are the partners or the physicians happy? And that's why it's important for your partner to meet the other partners in a social environment. If you get together and everyone's separated or divorced, standing around, that's probably not a good place to go because that means that it's not a very friendly work environment where people don't get along. If everyone seems to be friendly and open, that's a good environment to be in. The thing that is least important, believe it or not, is the pay over time. I mean, physician salaries across the board are shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. You want to have a reasonable work-life balance and you want to be comfortable and pay your bills. So if you go to an environment where the cost of living is low, forget about the money. If you go to California, New York, you got to think about money because you got to pay rent. You have to own a place. You have to be able to afford schooling, food, and so forth. So these are the things you think about. What would you say were some of the keys of your success that shaped your early career as you climbed the top of your industry? Well, it's unfortunate, but the keys to early success are being helped along by people above you. And I hate to say that because all through life you grow up and you want to be able to believe that everything you get, you do on your own. And we all believe that. And which is like exactly what doesn't happen in a lot of mature fields such as medicine. So you could be a superstar. Uh, but if the guy next to you is less than a superstar, but the guy above him likes him and says, listen, I'm going to promote you to this position. I'm going to promote you to this position. You're going to lose out. And guess what? That's, that's just life in the big times. So it's who you know, who you develop relationships with, and how you network. And those relationships will help you. And uh, so that's what helped me early on. I, I mean, Dr. Rothman liked me when I was younger. So Dr. Rothman touched me on the shoulder and said, listen, would you like to work here? That's how I got the job at the Rothman Institute, and I've never left before. So if I was like a superstar resident, who, who cares less? He needed to like me in order for me to get promoted. So really relationships. If you're difficult to get along with, you may not be going anywhere, unless you're a genius. Now, you would probably go places. Me, I would probably take time. So it's, you have to get along with people to go people. So that, that's what I learned early on. Now, when you get to be my age, and I'm 59 now, now it's a reflection more of, it's a meritocracy at my level. You know, you just, if you don't perform and you group this poorly, you're out. I'm the president of the Rothman Institute. Rothman Institute doesn't do well. Hey, thanks for your service. We need a president. So it changes as you get older. But when you're young, you know, you, you got to have all the prerequisites 
but you got to network, you got to get to know people and you got to be likable. I think talking about that networking seems to be a topic that comes up a lot with candidates that I speak to. What advice or suggestions do you have for them given that the COVID pandemic is still kind of going on right now and people can't go to national conferences? You know, what type of advice do you have for them in these situations? Yeah, so the pandemic hit a lot of my young surgeons hard. Two of my surgeons, when they graduated, had jobs. And you and I had spoken briefly about it. They got a phone call in April, May. Oh, by the way, you don't have a job anymore. So your start date on July 1st is gone. Or, you know, you have a job, but listen, I got to cut you back 30% on your salary. And can you start in October? That, that happened to people that graduated. So how do people connect? It's very, very difficult to connect. Now, the Zoom world has really evolved, which is amazing. Like tonight, I, I'm in a Zoom meeting. And apparently you've, it's like a three-dimensional virtual reality space. Like you get there, like you see people, you, you have avatars of people's bodies that you can talk to. So that space is growing. And we're doing a lot of that. I do three of those a week, these virtual, you know, big meetings. I was on a meeting that had 5,000 people. I was in a meeting that had 7,000 people. I mean, it's crazy, all the people. And it's interesting, uh, the South American meetings, because they get Spain and all the Spanish-speaking countries, really know how to get the meetings together. In North America, we're having meetings anywhere from 75 to 500 uh, in North America. Uh, I did the European Spine Society last Friday, and that's a larger meeting. So that's what you'd have to do. You, ha you have to do the networking on Zoom. You have to get out there. Wherever the space is, now, I'm 59, so I never really got into Facebook or Instagram. I just not, never got into it. I, never got, I, I don't tweet or anything. Uh, and that's another world that you can get into. I never got into it. I'm, I'm probably better off that I had not gotten into it. But if I had to connect, if I was younger, I probably should be in that world. My, la my last thing that I want to tell people, it's a, it was an interesting article last week. Be careful when you come out. I mean, you're so used to climbing the ladder, climbing the ladder. And uh, give your progression and your elevations and your raises and your promotions time to develop. A lot of people want to go to the next level, go to the next level. But you're going to be disappointed in life. I mean, it's like every, you, you don't get promoted every month. I noticed that a lot of the younger surgeons come out. They, you know, they're in a position for six weeks and they want to get promoted to something more. I'm like, listen, take your time, learn your trade, be a great surgeon, learn how to interact with patients, learn how to communicate well with patients. And you will eventually go to where you deserve to be through merit over time. So don't be in a rush. Enjoy life. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Interview with the Surgeon. Until next time, stay focused and keep following your dreams.